Welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church Online. My name is Marian Brown, one of the associate pastors, and this is our on-demand version of the sermon that will be preached on this Sunday morning. And please know that our Sunday services will be live streamed beginning at 9 a.m. for the contemporary service and 11.15 for the traditional service. If you would like to have the entire worship experience on demand, that will be available on Monday morning. We appreciate you being a part of our online community and we invite you to be active and participate through your giving. And so we thank you for your support and your generosity. Before we listen to this Sunday sermon, let's have a moment of prayer. Gracious and holy Lord, we ask that you remind us that wherever we are, we are on holy ground. And so may you help us make space. So may we receive a message that you have for us in this moment. Be in our hearts so that it's open. Be in our ears so that they are open and be a part of our lives so that we are open to receive a challenge and an invitation. Work within us now and all around us so that we may know your presence and we may feel it fully. Through a moment now of words and scripture, speak to us, amen. Let's listen to this Sunday sermon. This morning I'll be preaching from the book of Acts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts in the New Testament, Acts chapter 4, and I'll be reading verses 5 through 13, and this is what it says. And it came about on the next day that their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem, and Annas, the high priest, was there, and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of high priestly descent. And when they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has, become, has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene whom you crucified whom God raised from the dead by this name this man stands here before you in good health he is the stone which was rejected by you the builders but which became the very cornerstone and there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were marveling and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. Pray with me. Jesus, this day, it's your day. May this day, may we be, may we be recognized as having been with you. That, that what goes on here here in your presence, may we never take it for granted. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Calvin Miller tells a story about a kindergarten teacher in Southern California. It was the 1970s and the hippie culture was pretty popular where she was. And so she was accustomed to some of her students having some unusual names like Snow Princess and Panache and things like that. She wasn't prepared for one child she had this particular year. His name was Fruit Stand. The parents were to have prepared a, a, a name tag for their, their children so the, the teachers could call them by name. So uh, all day long, she was trying to, to prepare the child for different things that would go on during the day. Kindergartners needed a lot more instruction. And so if they were getting ready, she would call him by fruit stand, come over. It's time for us to prepare to go outside or fruit stand, come over and have a snack. Well, fruit stand was a little bit slow on the uptake, but he, he took part in it. It wasn't until the end of the day that 
she was preparing the children to get on the bus. Well, the kindergartners didn't know their bus stops, so part of the preparation the parents were to do is on the name tag on the front side, have the, the child's name on the back side, have the bus stop. And sure enough, she turned over his name tag, and there it was, Anthony. <laughs> well, maybe you've been called by the wrong name before. Uh, hopefully it wasn't fruit stand. Uh, if you've been called by the wrong name before, you know what, <laughs> what it's like. I remember one year when I was in high school, the whole year, the teacher called me by my brother's name. And every time that I would say, my name's Tom, I'm not Bill, the teacher would say, ah, what's in a name? It's just what you hang your identity on. <laughs> it didn't, I thought it was funny, but it didn't make me feel a whole lot better. What's in a name? Those were the words penned by William Shakespeare. He penned them coming out of the mouth of Juliet. And there she, she says, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. Well, she's not talking about roses. What she's talking about is Romeo. That she loves Romeo and his last name is Montague. And why should that make a big difference? Well, the big difference is there's a blood feud between her family and the Montague family. And they don't have to know him. She loves him. It's his name that the family hates. And so she's, she's trying to, in this, she's trying to say that the name shouldn't make any difference. But we know that's not the case. When we choose names for children, we don't just pull one out of a hat. We think about it. We go over it. What does the name represent? What does it mean to us? What will it mean to the child? We ask a zillion questions about that name before we name our children. That, 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 that names matter. In the Old Testament, the name of God. It was so important. It was so holy. It was, it was so set apart and sacred that it wasn't to be used as a matter of fact, there are very few times that the, the name of God is written. And when it is, it's not written out completely. Even today, we aren't exactly positive how to pronounce. Is it Yahweh or is it Jehovah? It's because th there are no vowels written there. Most often, God is called God, which is a title. Not Yahweh or Jehovah. Most often in the, in the Old Testament, he's called Lord. He's called Almighty. He's called by, by a title or, or, or something that refers to, to what he does. And now, now, Jesus. Jesus is, is the name of God. The angel Gabriel came to Mary and Joseph and said, you will have a child and you shall call his name Jesus, which means God saves. And the angel goes on to say, for he will save his people from their sins. Well, a human being can't do that. Only God can save us from our sin. Well, Jesus was one of the most common of names. It was very much in the, in the rhythm and melody of everyday life. So here there's a, a name change, a name change that, that, that God is going from a, a name, Yahweh or Jehovah, a name that even one of the Ten Commandments says you're not to use it in vain. You don't use it frivolously, and it's better not to use it at all, as a matter of fact, to be in a name that's in the, the rhythm and melody of everyday life. Maybe you've tasted that a little bit before. Maybe parents of someone that you grew up with, you called them Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and then once you became an adult, they said, oh, please call me Bob. And the first time you try it, and the second and third time, is, well, it just feels weird. That's all there is to it. Because you gave a name to them that was more of a, a title, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. And now to be called by the first name, there's a change in relationship. It's not just a change in the name. It's a change in the relationship. It's a change in the relationship. And now Peter and John again and again are calling on the name of Jesus. It's not a name to be so holy and sacred and separate that it's not to be used in the here and now. 
that Peter and John, they go into Jerusalem into a gate called Beautiful. That's not a description of it. That's the name of the gate. And there's a man there that he's not been able to walk since he was born. He's asking for alms, just a little money, a little anything that he can get by for that day. And Peter turns to him and says, look at me. Fix your gaze on me is, is what he says. And he says, silver and gold, I don't have any. But what I do have, I give to you. And this is what he says, in the name of Jesus, walk. Well, tells us that the man didn't just slowly kind of totter and get up. He leapt up and he began dancing. Hadn't walked a step in his life and now he jumps up and he's dancing. Well, that created so much a stir that people started crowding around. And Peter began to preach. He began to tell them, who Jesus was, how he had been crucified, how he died, how he was buried, and that God raised him from the dead. And the very power that raised Jesus from the dead was now the power that healed this man who was sick. Well, that didn't sit well with the rulers of the day. The rulers, it gives their names right here. Annas, Caiaphas, John and Alexander. They weren't just rulers of the Jews in Jerusalem. They were rulers for the Jews over the whole world, and they have them on trial. And they ask them, by what name? By what name, says in verse 7, have you done this? It's the name of Jesus. It's the name of Jesus in the, in the rhythm and melody of everyday life. It's in the name of Jesus that this man is healed. It's the name of Jesus that, that we're invited to call on. We're invited to call on in the everyday and in the rhythm and melody of the here and now because there's power in that name. And that's the first thing that I want to talk about this morning. Power in the name of Jesus. Verse 10 it says, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. That it's the power of the name of Jesus that healed the man. Chagun Shugiyara was born in 1900. It was his life's dream and ambition to be the Japanese ambassador to Russia. He was born in Tokyo and he spent his, his life's work. He was just one step away from being appointed as the Japanese ambassador to Russia. He was the Japanese ambassador to Lithuania. The year was 1939. That was the year that Hitler invaded Poland. As soon as Hitler invaded Poland, Jews from Poland and everywhere else began to flood into Lithuania and they wound up there on the, the property in the front yard of the Japanese ambassador. What they were seeking was not asylum there in Lithuania. What they were seeking were visas that they could get out of the area, that they could get away from Hitler. Three times Chagun Shugiyara wired Japan seeking permission to write visas for the, the Jews that were there in front of him. Three times he was denied. Chagun Shugiara was a Christian, and he knew what Jesus was calling him to do. He also knew that if he were to write visas after having been told no, there'd be severe consequences. For 28 days straight, Chagun Shugiara began to write visas for all the Jews that he could. He slept very little, he ate very little, he drank very little. And it's estimated that he saved over 6,000 lives in those 28 days writing visas for them. Later on, his son was asked how his father felt about the decision and how his father felt about losing the dream that he had always had. His son told him, said, well, 
His father was called back to Tokyo and was forced to sell light bulbs on the streets of Tokyo for the rest of his life as a way of scratching out a, a living. He went from being ambassador to selling light bulbs on the street. And his son said, my father's life was fulfilled when God needed him to do the right thing. He was available to do it. There's power in the name of Jesus to know the will of God and to do it. Jesus came so you and I might know the will of God, that it wouldn't be a mystery to keep us wondering that we might know the will of God. And he rose from the grave to give us power, power to do the will of God. It's the name of Jesus that we're to call on as you would call on a friend, as you would call on the name of one that you love with heart and soul and mind and strength, as you'd call on the name of a Savior. In the rhythm and the melody of, of every day, call on the name of Jesus. For in the name of Jesus, there's power available for you today. Not one day, but today. There's power in the name of Jesus. But not only power, verse 12 tells us there's salvation in the name of Jesus. This is what Peter says, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. It was the angel Gabriel that said, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus means God saves. And He's called God saves because that's what he does. But so often when we use that word save or salvation, we put it over here in our religious box. Separate, set aside, holy and religious. And, and we only open that religious box for religious purposes. That's not what the name of Jesus was used for. It's not what saved or salvation. We've missed the point that that word save or salvation was, was a word used in every day in ordinary life. It was a word that meant safe return, home, home. Safe return home was to be saved. It was a word that was used when someone was made whole or made well. We get the idea and the, the root of the word salvation is that word salve, salve. It's a, it's a salve, it's a healing balm to be used in the, in the everyday, in the ordinary. Jesus is the one that brings us home where we belong. Jesus is the one that makes us whole. I have a friend that tells a story about going hunting on his grandfather's farm. He said he was out all day hunting, and when he noticed the sun going down, he looked around, and he had no idea where he was. And he knew east from west, but he had wandered in a place where all he could do was stick his gun in the air and start firing it, hoping that his grandfather or someone would hear and, and come lead him out of the woods. So often it is we get lost. We begin to wander. Maybe it's worry. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's heartbreak. Maybe we've wandered far from home. 1 Peter 3.18 says, Christ died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God. Having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. It's his Spirit that brings us to God, that takes us where we can't go on our own. We make no great claims that, yeah, well, we were on our way there. No. It requires a, a humility, a humbleness where we, we turn to Him and call on Him in the everyday, in the ordinary, in the rhythm and melody of everyday life. That we call on the name of Jesus. We call on the name of Jesus because He does what we can't. He brings us home. He makes us whole. To call on the name of Jesus the way that you would a friend, 
the way that you would with one that you love with heart and soul and mind and strength, the way that you would a Savior, someone who leads you home. His name is Jesus. Call on his name. Call on his name. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's salvation in the name of Jesus. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning, there's confidence in the name of Jesus. Verse 13, this is what it says. It says, and now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were marveling and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. So often it is we put our confidence in our education. We put our confidence in our training well, Peter and John, they were on trial. They couldn't put their confidence in their education. They couldn't put their confidence in their training because they didn't have any. The only place for them to put their confidence is in Jesus. That it's not a, a what we put our confidence in. It's a, it's a who we put our confidence in. And that word confidence that word confidence, it's a, it's a wonderful word. It's a Latin word, and it's, it's, it's a Latin word made of two words, con, which means with, and fide, which means faith. Well, it, it's, we have faith, we have trust in a person, not in a, a list of rules or not in our goodness. It's, it's, it's with a trust, a confidence, a reliance on, on Jesus. And we're changed, not by our education, not by our training, but by Jesus, but by Jesus. At the end of the 20th century, Norman Vincent Peale was one of the most sought after speakers in the United States. Robert Schuller had invited him to the Crystal Cathedral to speak. In his introduction, this is what Robert Schuller said, he said, I want to introduce to you the most dynamic person you will ever meet in your life. He is exciting and positive and winsome. He can reach down inside of you more deeply than anyone else you have ever known before. He will give you self-confidence and courage and a whole lot of other things you have always wanted in your life but have not had. Well, Norman Vincent Peale wondered how in the world he was going to live up to an introduction like this. Fortunately, he didn't stand. And Dr. Schuler went on to say, the person of whom I'm speaking, of course, is Jesus Christ. And here to tell you about him is my friend, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. Well, Jesus does. Jesus does give us confidence and courage and a whole lot of other things that you've always wanted in your life but have not had. It's not just those things that we want in the afterlife. Yes, it's those things too. But whenever the Bible talks about eternal life, it's not talking about just the afterlife. It's talking about a quality, a texture of life that starts in the here and now, that starts today. 1 John 5.13 says, These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. Not that you may wonder if you have eternal life or you might think that you have eternal life, that you may know. Jesus came that we may know him and have confidence in him, in the everyday, in the ordinary, in the rhythm, in the melody of everyday life. Call on his name. Call on his name. The way you would a friend. Call on his name the way you would, one that you love, with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. Call on his name the way that you would a Savior who leads you home. Because that's who he is. And he's here with us now. This morning it may be that you had great reverence for Jesus. Jesus. As one who lived a long time ago who had many great teachings to give. But you haven't ever called on his name as the one that's here with you now. That the name of Jesus hasn't become a part of the rhythm and melody of your everyday life. That Jesus is just a name that's been relegated to that religious box that you pull out when you're feeling especially religious. 
Jesus is here now today. And it may be that you're in that place where you've wandered from home. Or it may be that you're in that place where you know that you're broken. And you need to be made whole. That you want to belong, but you don't have confidence that you do. That's why Jesus came. So you and I would know that we would know we belong to him starting today and for eternity. I invite you to call on his name and to do it now as we pray together. Pray with me. Let's pray. Jesus, this day, we call on your name. Call on your name. And may this not be the only time, but we call on your name because we know that what we need is power we don't have. Power. Power to know you're willing to do it. It may be that we've wandered away or there's a brokenness. And we've, we've, we've whined and complained about our brokenness, but we haven't called on you. We may have, have looked for self-help, but we haven't called on you. We may have felt very sorry but we haven't called on you. Jesus, this day, we call on you the way we would a friend, the way we would the the one that we love with heart and soul and mind and strength, that you might give us that power we need to follow, to obey, that you might bring us home, that you might make us whole, and Jesus, that you might give us, well, a confidence, a confidence, a courage, that when others see us, they might recognize that we've been with you, and that our lives be transformed. I do believe this morning, Jesus, that there are folks that are are calling on you now and asking for you to to make your home in, in their heart. You've written this that we might we might know, call on your name and, and know that we have your life in us. A life that's abundant and full, that has the texture of eternity. And from this day and in the days to come, may we call on your name and not wonder about life. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online. It is a blessing to have the gift of technology to have sermon this way. We thank you for participating. And just a reminder, if you want to see the live services, 9 a.m. on Sunday for contemporary and 1115 Sunday morning for traditional services. And always we will have the full on-demand worship experience on Monday morning. And if there's ever a time that you would like to join us here at the physical location, we're located at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, Roswell, Georgia. We want to be connected with you. If you have a prayer request, please let us know by emailing pray at rumc.com. And we would love for you to be a part of our ministry through your giving. If you would like to support our campus and our ministries, you can do so at rumc.com slash give. And now hear these words of a benediction. Love without fear, serve with commitment. And in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. <laughs>